And welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable. This is your host, Shane Bailey. Have Blair Smiley on the other side of the monitor here. Welcome, Blair Smiley. It's good to be back, Shane. How are you doing? I am doing wonderful. Thank you so much for asking. Going to spend just a second talking about what we have here. Uh, if you're just now tuning in for the first time, uh, again, it's SEC Sports Roundtable. Uh, we normally have uh, anywhere from two to six individuals that sit around and we talk about SEC sports. We're going to talk about what might have happened last week that we liked or disliked, uh, what we thought was good or bad. Uh, we talk a little bit about any news that might be happening uh, in the SEC this week, and we also take a look uh, at any of the games that are of importance to us, at least, that uh, are are coming up for, for Saturday. At least now we're talking about football. Uh, I, wearing the blue and white, uh, am a Kentucky fan. So you will see me have a lot more to talk about as we progress here. Uh, and football starts to wind down. There's a little more for Kentucky fans to be happy about. Uh, so I, I know that media days for basketball was ju just, I think, just was in the books. Uh, and the, the media reporters are, uh, are high on Kentucky again. I don't understand why. Uh, why, why they're there again. But, uh, no, seriously. Uh, they're, high, they're high on my Bulldogs, too. Yeah, we, we just rebuild and, and start all over again and make it happen. Uh, but we are in the middle of football. I mean, we are week seven, so halfway through at counting bye weeks and everything, everybody's about halfway through with their season. Uh, a lot of good actions happened. A lot of teams have played some really tough opponents. Uh, but there's also a lot of really good teams that have some really good opponents still left to play, especially when you look at that West uh, schedule in the SEC uh, it, seem, it seems to be a little more backloaded than the, the East's uh, slate of games, and, and things are shaking up in the East. And we can talk just a little bit about that. But, you know, I want to take just a second and thank those that are listening. Uh, YouTube, we do a Google Hangout uh, every week of this podcast. We were doing a video version uh, for the ease of all the hosts. We're just doing it uh, remotely right now, seeing how this works out. Uh, most days it works pretty well. Some days we have some some technical issues, so we work through that. But uh, we do the Google Hangout on YouTube. Uh, we're getting about seven thousand views a month uh, on the YouTube channel, Blair. I, I, I can't nice. believe. Nice. Yeah, um, getting getting close to eight thousand. Uh, some of them uh, are are just interested in uh, they they see the literal versions of our titles and. And if anyone listens to the podcast, they know that that's taken from something, uh, some sort of context of the podcast itself. So, you know, I've had some really nice comments from YouTube from individuals going, there's no dog eating out of a skillet. Um, you know, of course there's not. There's, yeah. If they look at the, <laughs> the, the video, it's got two guys sitting there with headsets on or three guys sitting there with headsets on. It's in the category of sports, and there's no dogs in our videos. So. So, except for yours in your lower third there, Blair, I, I, maybe he's the one that's eaten out of a skillet. Trying. But, but uh, so we do that. We also do an audio version. Uh, we're on Stitcher Radio. Or, that's an app. I haven't talked about those guys in a while, but I was looking at some statistics there uh, for, for the podcast and just want to take a second to thank th those individuals that are listening uh, on Stitcher. There's over, I looked it up, there's over 10,000 uh, podcasts uh, that Stitcher says are on their network, so to speak, and we're in the top 25% of all podcasts. So for awesome. a bunch, for a bunch of guys just sitting around at a table uh, talking SEC sports, you know that's pretty strong. Uh, the other day we also did a search on iTunes. That's the other place that we we get a lot of traffic. And if you search for SEC sports and podcasts, we were the number one uh, listed podcast there. So hats off to all you guys listening in. Uh, and thank you so much for doing that. I uh, never would have dreamed that those type of figures were out there. Uh, we just sit around and, and talk SEC sports. So I wanted to take a minute on the front end of this. I know I'd, I'd want to do some housekeeping towards the end, but wanted to thank everybody for, for going out there and, and doing those things, watching, uh, listening, whatever way you want to consume the podcast. We, we greatly appreciate that. Uh, we do this for fun, but we also like to know that there's people out there listening. Uh, and liking what we're doing. So, uh, you know, if, if you are listening and like this, you know, let us know. Go out there on iTunes, give us some uh, good reviews, go out on YouTube, subscribe to the channels. That way you get these 
whenever they show up. And we're also on Facebook. These audio and video versions uh, show up on the Facebook page as well. So you, you've got lots of ways to, to interact and watch the, the podcast. And we'd love to hear from you guys uh, and, and know what you like, what you want to see us do different. We're trying to change some things up the way we, we do our format and not go through every single game and the drudgery that, that comes of that. So we're, we're trying to mix things up and see how that works. Uh, but we'd like to hear from you guys what, what, you, what you've enjoyed listening to over the last basically year and a half uh, that we've done this podcast. So that's me. Uh, I'm the host. I, I've run this thing. I've been here for 59 episodes right now. Uh, Blair, Blair and Drew are my two main co-hosts, and, and Blair's quickly gaining on him, uh, Drew if he's not already <laughs> passed him for a number of times being on here. So thanks so much for your insight and joining in. Uh, but let's get right into to looking at last week's games. And, and we're going to start with, uh, let's talk about Vanderbilt and Auburn. Uh, were you expecting that game to be, what, what you, did you get to watch most of that game, Blair? I, I actually, I did not get to watch uh, most of it, Shane. I actually, uh, my, Sarah and I actually spent a weekend away last weekend in Chattanooga. So uh, got to watch a little bit. I watched a little bit of the LSU and Texas A&M game, but was unable to watch the Auburn um, Fandy game. I've read a little bit about it, but uh, um, it, it. I mean, what do you say about Auburn? Uh, it's just. Yeah, I mean, it can't get any worse for those guys, and um, you know, good for Vanderbilt. I mean, when you look at their back end of the schedule, and this is what we talked about, um, and I think I mentioned it a couple of podcasts ago. Whenever I, I said I thought they're going to be. Missouri, I thought it was the game that they needed to go out and make a statement win if they were going to have a shot to get to that seven and five and, and really solidify a bid bowl, uh, a bowl bid, a bid bowl. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, hey, they're sitting here with a um, pretty good schedule here coming up that, uh, you know, I think that they're going to have a, a nice second half of the year. And they've got Vanderbilt's got to get three more wins to be bowl eligible at this point. And, and you look at it, what do they have? UMass this upcoming week. Uh, they yeah. still have Tennessee, which is uh, – I still don't know what Vanderbilt program we have. Um, I think they looked a little better than, than what they have in the past couple of weeks, so we're happy to see that. Um, but it's still not the same Vanderbilt program that I bought into when James Franklin was out there. Right. Uh, and you've got the billboards all over town and the, the blues music. What what was the, What's their slogan here in Nashville? Anchor Down. No, that's, that's – uh, uh, oh, uh, things are things are change. Things are going to change. Things yeah. are going to change, and it's got a big bluesy backbeat to the to the yeah. the commercials and stuff. And it's some it's some great media. It is great. But, but those most of those things to me haven't changed from Vanderbilt and West yeah. End. Uh, and and I, I want to see them do better. I don't want to see them do better against Kentucky. But you know, I do want to see them improve and, and do well because I think Franklin's a good coach. But they've had some hiccups, and it was nice to see them get that win over Auburn. Yeah. Uh, you know, for, for disrespect um, that Auburn's received, when's the last time they've went into a, a game like Auburn and were favored by a touchdown? Yeah. You know, I mean, so – That's that's the – that was a crazy thing. And, and, I mean, it was a good win for Vanderbilt. But, I mean, when you look at their schedule, I mean, it's what we talked about. I mean, they've still got Tennessee, Kentucky, Ole Miss, UMass, who they're going to win this weekend. I mean, they're a 35-point – uh, favorite or something to that that effect, and then they got Wake Forest. Um, so you can realistically look at all those games and say those are winnable games, um, you know, going down the stretch. And so, uh, you know, you win, what, four out of those five, you're sitting at seven and five. And, uh, yeah, but so, I, I, let me ask you, do they have four out of five there? I'll, I'll give them Wake and UMass. I'm not sold on either one of those teams, and they're not SEC, so we're always going to go with the SEC in that situation. But we can talk about it in a minute. Kentucky played really, really well against Georgia. Uh, yeah. You know, therefore they had some some bad things go their way again. It's the same old Kentucky as far as those things go. But they didn't give up. They fought back. They stayed in that game. I think they were they only lost by what five or six. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think Vanderbilt's thing is, and you know, I don't want to waste too much time on Vanderbilt. But I think it's if you know. Zach Stacy can run the football. You know, we knew they lost some really critical guys on defense. And uh, so the, the ability um, to kind of sustain, they weren't going to be as good a defensive team as they were last year. So you can't have Jordan Rodgers make turnovers like he had in the first part of the year. So he settled down a little bit from that uh, where they weren't turning 
over the ball. Um, and when you're not doing that, you'll give yourself a chance to win. I think Kentucky, they did play well, but do you know where Kentucky's going to be in a couple of weeks? That's the thing. I think Kentucky and Tennessee are those two teams where they can – you don't really know where they're going to be. You don't know what the coaching world is going to be like. I don't think Kentucky is as in much flux as Tennessee's vibrato is right now around that program. Um, you know, they take another thump into South Carolina this week. You could all change where those guys are. Are they going to check out and not even be, you know, in Kentucky? Uh, I mean, it's just one of those types of things where I think that game in Nashville, it's a lot tougher game, especially with the way they lost the game in Knoxville last year. But but yeah, you can say that they could check out. They could check out for all the games, but there's two games that Tennessee can get back up for, even if everything else is is you know halfway out the door, if not already packed. And that's going to be Kentucky and Vanderbilt because of the comments that were made last year mm -hmm. at the Vanderbilt game after the Vanderbilt game, and then the way Kentucky finally broke the streak against. Uh, Tennessee. So both of those teams have the have the ability to get up. Uh, and, and Ole Miss is a much different team than than we saw at the beginning of the season. And yeah. and you can attest to that as well. Being down a, a fan of everything in Mississippi, uh, you, you, and being a, a state fan, you definitely want to know what the pulse is of Ole Miss. And that pulse is getting a little faster. Yeah. Uh, so you've got an Ole Miss program that's on the rise. You've got a, a Tennessee and Kentucky program that that's definitely not where they need to be, but uh, against the Vanderbilt program, you know, are they going to be heavily favored? So you've got three still tough games to go in the SEC for me for Vanderbilt. Uh, and, you know, Kentucky can play spoiler. Tennessee can still yeah. play spoiler. And, and put put that, you know, all three of those teams sitting there uh, not in a bowl game. And that, I don't right. think it would make anybody less uh, happy than Kentucky and Tennessee fans to know that they at least were able to do those type of things uh for, for a Vanderbilt Vanderbilt program. So, so what is, who does Vanderbilt play after UMass? Um, uh, let me. Do you know what they play next week, the third? I do. I've got it right here. They've got Kentucky, and then okay. they, and then they have Ole Miss. And I think I think the Kentucky game is a pivotal game because that'll make three wins in a row, if I'm not mistaken. Um, no, no, no. They had the Florida game in there, but that'll be three out of four. Um, wins that you're kind of building on a little bit of a momentum if you're able to go into a Kentucky and play a good game. I think if Vanderbilt plays a good game, doesn't turn the ball over, um, they can beat Kentucky. And if they do that, then I think that maybe leapfrogs them and keeps that you know confidence rolling. Sure, they I think they, they can lose that game and then the, do the exact opposite. Yeah, um, I can think they can win or lose any one of those three SEC matchups. And so now you, you, we said they were what? Did we say they're at four and three? Three and four, or things, yeah. Three and four. So we're going to give them the two out of conference. They've got to get. They have to win uh, one of those three, and they c could realistically lose all three. Yeah. Um, so you know, we still we still have a lot to go as far as where Vanderbilt might end up, and and you know, as a Kentucky fan, I'm going to mention those guys looked good. Uh, I know you've tweeted me a couple times and, and sent me text messages about how riddled our, our defense and our offense is. And uh, some of those stats you were, were giving me were just mind-blowing about how many freshmen are, are seeing just tremendous amounts of game time yeah. uh, for that Kentucky program. But it's good to see that, you know, I mean, if that, if that Georgia game showed you anything, is they're not giving up. Uh, there's still some fight left in those Wildcats, and, and we'll see what happens. I mean, they've got two winnable games against Tennessee and against uh, Vanderbilt, the way those two programs are. Uh, if, if Vanderbilt, I'm sorry, if Kentucky plays the way they did against Georgia, against Vanderbilt and against Kentucky, the way that defense stepped up, the way they were able to move the ball some, they had some offense, they were able to get the running game going a little bit, you can actually cause some problems for Tennessee and for Vanderbilt. And you never know what can happen in those situations for Kentucky. And if you can win with a, a couple of those wins, let's just say, I think right now it's a toss up with Missouri this week. Yeah, I mean, I think what you got to see is uh, Shane is. I think the one thing that we did learn is that Tennessee is going to allow you to score points on them. Um, Vanderbilt is not going to be just complete. You know, last year they hung their hat on their defense and they had playmakers that could make plays. They had very, very, very 
um, experienced guys on the defensive front, and as long as they didn't make turnovers on the on the offensive side of the ball, um, they could play conservative and really hang their hat and, and and do that. This year, they really can't, and so they've got they've they they can kind of go either way. So um, I think you're right there, but I think Tennessee has shown you that you know I mean they've given up you know almost 200 points, 173 points in four SEC games, so. Tennessee's not going to get any better, I don't think, on defense. I'm, they're they're going to be one that you're going to be able to put some points up. It's just, um, you know, can you can you stop Bray? Does Bray and and Hunter and those guys get out of their funk? Um, yeah. You know, especially those last two games that they've that they've put together, where Tyler Bray's under 200 points. I mean, 200 yards a game, and Hunter's not played well. They've regressed um, the last couple of weeks, and so. Um, but who knows? I mean, we don't know where Tennessee's going to be after this week. If they if they get the doors blown off of them and they give up 40 points to South Carolina, you know, where is that program going to be? I mean, you know, I mean, in the last two days, it's gone from, hey, John Gruden might be interested to John Gruden wants the job. Um, I mean, it's 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 ramping up, and so um, those are things that are going to be kind of interesting to see and watch. And I think that Missouri. Vanderbilt, Kentucky, Tennessee, East side of things, there's no telling way it's going to end. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, one of them can win it all. One of them can, you know, so they're going to kind of beat up on each other here at the very end where um, those heavy hitters are, are, are kind of vying for um, those last spots there in the East. I, I, I will agree completely 100% there, which – I wish there were times where we would like to disagree sometimes in this podcast, but we are we are so on the pulse of the SEC and know what's going on in the bottom of the barrel down there because we I've lived it so long that it's it's easy to, uh, yeah. to to say and and Mississippi State's been down there for all, at times as well. Oh, but yeah. uh, you're right. I mean we we have put a lot of time talking about you know some four four basement teams, but what you are seeing and, and this is the last thing I want to say about Kentucky at least for a few minutes is that uh, they're not in the discussion as far as the worst teams in the in the Division One or, or BCS yeah. uh, programs any longer. And, uh, and and strong performances like they had against Georgia can, can roll them over into some winnable games. I mean, they're still almost two touchdown um, underdogs at Missouri. Um, you know, you, you come in to, and I don't know, if Franklin comes back finally, are they going to be a, a better program? Because yeah. I think that's been a big issue for – for those guys over there in Missouri is that uh, James Franklin's been hurt this whole time Yeah. Uh, for like the last four or five weeks. So a lot of those performances that you're getting from them aren't really the, the performances that you were expecting out of the, the, the Tigers over there. Um, but let me ask you, are you more surprised the way Alabama is played um, or Oregon has played? And, and, and I think, and you, you listen to the way some of this stuff is, I, uh, has has played out as far as the BCS and and what I've learned over the years is that 98 percent of that stuff is going to work itself out. We still have four more weeks left as far as BCS goes. You got Florida at number two, Alabama at number one. One of those two programs will not be there. Right. It's just it's a simple fact. Um, and, and is that going to be Florida after this week at the cocktail party? Uh, again, it depends on what Georgia shows up. Um, you know, so that that could they could quickly fall out of it, uh, and, and they still have Florida State. Uh, what you could see is that Florida could still go in the e. Here's here's a scenario for you: Florida wins the S wins the SEC East undefeated, and then they would have to be undefeated. Otherwise, the only real uh, hiccup is Georgia this week with those guys because their schedule gets drastically easier. Uh, the last couple weeks, except for Florida State, but then they they run up against the bus off Florida State and lose. Now all of a sudden, they're going to go into the SEC championship one loss. Now they beat they you know they're going to slide. Let let let's let's throw this scenario out there. They're going to slide to five or six. They go in and beat Alabama. Now all of a sudden Alabama's got a one loss. Florida's got a one loss. Who's going to the national championship? Well, and I think that's what you got to find out in the top five and how it all works itself out. I think right now, you know, to allude to your first question, yeah, are you more surprised with Alabama or Oregon? 
Um, I'm not really surprised by either one of them, to be honest with you. I'm a little bit more surprised that Oregon's defense is better than I thought it would be, but they're also still playing that Pac-10 world. How, how does their defense stack up? Are they going to be able to stack up against an Alabama that can actually put five All-American offensive linemen out there and run the football, and, and can they, over a four-quarter game, be able to do that? Um, so we don't really know, but I think your scenario is this. Basically, is a one-loss yeah, there were two team. questions there, wasn't yeah. there? Yeah. So is a is a one loss is there or is there a one loss team from the SEC um, that loses before the SEC championship and then beats the other team to give them their one loss in the SEC championship? If one of those teams is going to be able to get into, it. and it all depends. It really depends on what Notre Dame does because right now they're in the top five, and if they go undefeated, you can say that they actually play the schedule. That'll warrant them to be in the conversation, and then you got to see what Kansas State I think that might... um, in that world does. So I think it's all going to work itself out. I think I don't think that we have to. And, I don't think we have to worry about three undefeated teams being there, um, and you having to pick two out of the three. I think it's going to be a scenario where you still maybe have one undefeated, and you got a couple of one loss teams that you got to figure it out. Yeah, and so. and. You know, we play this what-if scenarios all day long, and, and most of the time it does work itself out. But the reason I asked, are you more surprised with Oregon or Alabama, and it's not that Alabama is not a great team, and we didn't think they would be, but they they completely dominated a, for, let's just admit it, a, a lesser program they played. And what, what no one really talks about with Alabama here the last week or two that I've heard, and I could be wrong, is, They've had just a front-end loaded schedule the way it's worked out that's as easy as Oregon's. So mm -hmm. they both have a back-end loaded schedule that becomes very difficult. I mean, they've got, what, a three-game stretch of Mississippi State, LSU, and then uh, – Texas A&M. And A&M. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, we've already seen A&M's greatly been improved program. So those were three tough games that Alabama's going to have to go back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back against, uh, just like Oregon's got – uh, USC and was it Stanford? Yeah, and I think, and I think to kind of, I guess, add to that, Shane, is this: when you go into the season, you're like, okay, Alabama's playing Michigan. They're playing Arkansas three weeks or two weeks later. Um, you go into the season, you're saying, hey, we're going to know about Alabama in the first month. Oh, and yeah. guess what? We didn't really know much about them because Michigan wasn't that good. Arkansas didn't have Tyler Wilson, and they were a complete disaster. Um, then you roll into them going to Missouri and have a CBS game. You get in the middle of an absolute flood, and James Franklin doesn't play. Yeah. Um, you know, And then you have a Tennessee team that you think is going to be better. Um, it's really the same thing Mississippi State's been done. You know, Mississippi State's been getting killed because their schedule has been soft. That's what, the, that's what everybody's talked about. They haven't really played anybody. Well, that's the whole point. That was the whole point before the season was – what did we actually say? Mississippi State could be six and one or seven and zero oh going into Tuscaloosa. They shouldn't be any worse than that, okay? But did you think that Auburn was going to be better? Yes. You thought Tennessee was going to be better? Yes. And uh, they ended up being not as tough and being you know, Auburn being a disaster. Tennessee just yeah you know, they're they're sitting here in the end of October and Dewey's there's a good chance he's not ever going to win a game in October for, for Tennessee. Um, and they haven't won an SEC game this year. So um, I think this is where we're going to find out, and, and this is what I'm interested about this game. But I, I think I think that's where I think that's where we're finding out that the West is it's ended up being backloaded because you have a basically about a four week stretch here where Texas A&M, LSU, Alabama, and Mississippi State are all going to play around robin, so to speak. Yeah. Um, you know, LSU and Texas A&M played last week. We're playing Alabama. You know, next week it's, you know, LSU and Alabama, Mississippi State and Texas A&M, and Alabama's playing Texas A&M the following week. So we'll know about the West really quick. Yeah, you, you still have A&M, LSU, and Alabama on your schedule. Yeah, in three weeks, three uh, straight weeks. And Alabama still has the same three things. Um, yeah. you know Alabama what? and us are basically playing the same schedule. LSU's got a week in between. Yeah. That's it. And so you really are going to see what, what's going to shake out on the West. Um, and and I, I really – I know that my question was worded weird and it wasn't correct, but 
I think we, we got to my point, and, and it's really we just don't know what Alabama we have yet. Right. Uh, not to not to say that they're bad. They're they're a really good team. Yeah. Uh, just like Oregon's a really good team, but we've still not seen either one of those programs play the caliber of of, of football that we need to say see to yeah. say wow they are that good. Yeah. And and, and I got a feeling they really are. Um, Otherwise, I, I don't know. Uh, Vegas is, is pretty good at this stuff. I think 23 is too big a number to, to, yeah. to hang up on, on Mississippi well, State. Actually, it's going back up to 24. And uh, so, I mean, it's, it's one of those things. And, and, and to get back on Oregon, even though, you know, you, when you talk about that, I mean, they're going to have to play USC and Stanford, and then they're going to have to play USC probably again in a championship. Um, you know, so they're going to have to – to win three games there. Alabama's going to have to go through this gauntlet of, you know, Texas A&M, LSU, and Mississippi State, and then they're going to have to beat a Florida or a Georgia in, this, in the SEC championships. So I think we'll know what they're going to do, and I, I think that's the thing that I'm interested about this week because I think I think as a Mississippi State fan, you you go into this season and you go, okay, I'm 7-0 and going into Tuscaloosa, man. You're, you're playing with house money. I mean, they don't build those places in – Vegas out of ten, and you know, in scrap, you know, they they build it with marble and everything else because they know what the heck they're doing, right? So, um, I think it's a high number, but I we don't we don't know what either team's going to do, and and that's what I'm interested about because Mississippi State actually plays better when you actually line up and hit them in the mouth, and you're just going to go straight at them. They kind of like that. You know, the Johnny Manziel is the game that I'm worried about. Going to the Texas A&M the next week, State doesn't ever really play well against a mobile quarterback like that. But you line up and run straight at us, we can deal with that a little bit easier. Um, you know, and so there's a lot of different matchups in that game coming up this week that I think are going to be interesting. Um, and we could get just totally blown out of the water, um, but something's telling me that, Alabama hasn't been tested. They haven't been punched in the mouth like we've talked about. Um, you know, they've led for all of – every. they've led basically the whole year except for 15 seconds when Ole Miss got a lead and then gave up a kickoff return. So they haven't really – you know, can you force them into a mistake? A.J. McCarron hadn't had a mistake in 10 games. Does he throw a pick? Well, and Does, I, You know, those are things. And I think that's where Mississippi State to really have a chance to to win the game, not just cover the spread, but to win this game, you're going to have to have some some chances that are going to have to come through for you. And I really mean that on the defensive side of the ball, you're going to have to have pressure up the middle to try to to get AJ McCarron uh, out of his game. But what that's going to do is that's going to leave your your uh, your safeties and your corners on some one-on-one coverage, and they're going to have to step up to the game and play the lights out. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, McCarron's going to burn you, and all that pressure's for naught. It's for six yeah. points the other way. But if it if it can come through and you can get that pressure and you can still handle those wide receivers for Alabama on man coverage, then you've got a chance. Um, and if you're and to be honest with you, Shane, if you're Mississippi State and you got Jonathan Banks and you got Darius Slay, you say, hey. You know, Let's do you know, it. Yeah, just go win you some money right here. We're going to send everything, sell out, and stop the run, make them one-dimensional, and we're going to make a freshman, Amari Cooper, who just runs all over Tennessee, you know, um, you know, has almost 200 yards receiving last week and has a breakout game. I mean, I'll take a freshman on Jonathan Banks any day of the week, um, you know, and that's where you got to go and say, hey, let's line it up and give it a shot. We got nothing to lose no, in the game. Right. And uh, so I think that I think they'll be really loose, and and you know I mean they're playing LSU next week. They're they're going to get the next two weeks. They're going to have to have some adversity, and we just haven't seen what they can do with it. And they're not as dominant of a team um, uh, from a defensive standpoint as they were last year. I mean that that was a you know once in a fifteen year generation type defense. I mean you just couldn't move the ball against them. Um, this one statistically is doing roughly the same thing, um, but um, they haven't really been tested like we thought they they were. So um, we'll see if Tyler Russell and Ladarius Perkins can, you know, I mean, who would have thought that Ladarius Perkins was going to be leading the SEC in rushing after seven games? Um, so I mean, it's uh, it's one of those things where they're really balanced this year. So I'm uh, I'm interested to see how it turns out. 
And, and the last thing we'll say about this game, and and it, it's the it is the spread, and what we have to keep in mind uh, if we're looking at this is it's not that they think that Alabama is going to win by that much. Uh, Vegas, you already talked about it. Vegas is all about the marble, the gold foil, and putting money in the bank. And they don't get that by losing. So what they have to do is they have to get enough people betting on Alabama as they do for Mississippi State. And so that might mean that they have to raise that number higher than realistically that game should be. Hey, Drew Young. What's going on, Mr. Bailey? Not much. And, and, and that's all we're going to say about Tennessee. Um, oh. <laughs> Good. I don't want to talk about them anyway. We're actually talking about the Alabama uh, Mississippi State game, Drew. Yeah, that's the game that uh, Alabama's going to win by about thirty. We well, we were just we were just re-educating everybody about uh, Vegas, and it's it it might be that Vegas has to get fifty percent of the money going each way, and so that number I think that number if you were to ask me before I heard that number was seventeen. Uh, is where I thought that number should be, uh, but Vegas needs to get more people betting Mississippi State, so they got to make that no, make it more lucrative for for folks to go to Mississippi State. Yeah, you're gonna have to fill me in. What's the line on that? Twenty four. Good grief! It's a large number, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that I'd be hard pressed not to to think that that Alabama's not gonna be able to handle them. Uh, but that being said, that I mean that's a lot of points. I, I, it'd be tough for me to pick against. It's State a lot of points to be eight games into the season and both teams be undefeated. Yeah, well, I, I mean, and Blair will tell you this. I mean, there's a big difference between Alabama and Mississippi State. I mean, there's there's no doubt. I think Mississippi State's a, a quality team, but but they're in a different league. I mean, I don't think there's really anybody in the same league as Alabama. So, uh, but once again, you're right. Twenty four points against any team is a lot. Uh, but an undefeated team, nonetheless, is, is quite a few points. Hey, Drew, we were just talking, you know, one of the things that we thought, you know, and, you know if you're looking at it from, you know, like my perspective as a state fan, you, you're sitting there going, okay, how can you actually come up with a win, right? Um, or how can you actually um, do something to win? And, and what we were just talking about was if you're Mississippi State, you got to put your two corners that are your guys and, and say, just lock them in and say, hey, you know, you go, you go match up with those guys. Let's bring pressure. Let's stop the run and try to make them one-dimensional and see if you can create. You, you got to create some type of mistakes um, and uh, and just stay in the ball game because Alabama. You know, when we were talking about this a minute ago, hasn't really been tested. Uh, they really haven't even been hit in the mouth um, and said, okay, hey, bam, here's seven points, and let's see how you react type of deal. Um, you know, and it's one of those things. It's going to be interesting, but uh, it, it's a tall task. But if you're 7-0 and and you're Mississippi State, you got nothing to lose. And, um, you know, you, you go out there loose and throw the whole kitchen sink at them, see if you can get a turnover. Well, yeah, I think you're right. I think the, the two big things that you're saying are correct, uh, the first of them being – uh, and, and knowing that Tennessee didn't have a much of a chance in that game. That's the first game Tennessee's played this year against Alabama that I thought they're not going to win this game. Uh, I mean, I thought there was a chance they could beat Mississippi State, and they played with them, and I thought there was a chance they could beat Florida or Georgia, and they played with them as well. But I thought if Tennessee was going to beat Alabama, Alabama was going to have to make mistakes uh, because Tennessee's defense wasn't good enough. So you're right. I think that the recipe to beat Alabama is, one, have a good defense um, because I think Alabama's defense is better than their offense, even though their offense is awesome. Uh, so I don't think you're going to score a lot of points on them. So you need to have a good defense, and, and you just need to catch them on a bad day. Uh, there's not many teams that are out there that can play with them, so you need uh, you need that team to make some mistakes. And 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 that's I mean Mississippi State's. I mean they I would say that they they can. I don't know I don't know how they can I don't know how they can win that game. I think you're right. They'd have to they'd have to jump out early and get a couple you know maybe get a well, they got, touchdown yeah. or, or they basically got to do what they've done all year, which is. They, they're opportunistic on defense. I mean, they lead the nation in turnover ratio, and they don't turn the ball over. So yeah. if you follow that recipe, okay. uh, the problem is is that you've got a quarterback that's the same way. I mean, Tyler Russell's throwing 15 passes and one pick, and McCarron just throwing 16 with no pick. So um, one of those guys, do they make a mistake? And who does, you know, really kind of turns the tide? So um, it's going to be interesting. I'm excited about it because, you know, as a Mississippi State fan, I mean, 
Seven and O is the second time since World War Two, dude. This doesn't happen often. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear you. I, I, I still think that. I mean, I think Mississippi State's not getting a ton of respect right now to be seven and O. Uh, but on the other hand, they really haven't beaten a ton of teams. So it's one of those things where it's hard to say that you really don't know what kind of team you got in a seven and O team. But I, I think that they. You know, Mississippi State could be a top 15. They could be, you know, the number 25 team in the country. You just don't yeah. know. They could be a top 10 team. Um, but it, it's just really hard to tell. It reminds me a lot of that uh, with the Arkansas team in, in 98 that played Tennessee. They were both undefeated. And, you know, Tennessee was a top two or three team. I think they might have been number one in the country. And, and Arkansas was like eight or nine. And, uh, and it, you know, it, it's just one of those things. I mean, they can, you know, they can really put themselves in the driver's seat to – to, to have a magical season if they can win. And if they lose, I mean, I don't think that, you know, the season's lost or anything. I think that this is a game that you have a lot more to gain than you do to lose. Yeah. And it's the one game that Mullen has not been competitive with. I mean, last year, you know, we lost 24-7, to which was the closest margin of anybody to them other than the LSU. But, um, but realistically, the three games at Mullen that we've played, it's really the team that we haven't been competitive with at all. And uh, so I, there's a lot of underlying things there that make me think that that they're going to play a game that's going to be a lot closer than 24 points. Um, I still think it's very difficult to to come out of there with a win. And if you come out of there with a win, you, you totally go to a level that, you know, you go from 11 to top five in the country, I think, and, uh, and all of a sudden become uh, a big talk. And, you know, it, it totally takes you to a different stratosphere. No, I agree. All right, I'm gonna. I was gonna make a segment together, but I never knew who was gonna be able to be on or not be on. I didn't know if it was gonna be just myself uh, up until like an hour or two ago when when Blair said his phone was dead, but he was still in for the the podcast. And then Drew's at a basketball practice, so um, I, so I said, all right, I'm scrapping that idea. But uh, I did have one question that that started this whole process for me, and it was gonna be um, H H U hurt helps or undecided or it doesn't matter and so I'll throw this out to you guys does neutral feel for the cocktail party hurt help or it doesn't matter for Georgia well if you take the history in the last what 23 years they've won what three times <laughs> or something um, you know oh man that's a tough one because you never see that game on either of the campuses so you don't know what the atmosphere is going to be I think that's a very unique game and I think the the environment that it's in kind of creates an atmosphere that you don't I don't think either team gets um, I think it's undecided I don't think it's either helps or hurts them I mean of course if you put it in Athens it's different if you put it in Gainesville it's different um, but but you you say that, but you're right though. They, they've only won three times in the last quarter century. Yeah. So I mean, statistically, it hurts them, but you wouldn't think it would. Drew, what do you think? Uh, I'm definitely going to go with hurt, but a kind of a different reason. Uh, I'm saying hurts because if you are basing it on the fact that this is not a home and home series, I think that there is much more of a home field advantage in Gainesville than there is in Athens. Yes. So the fact that it's always played, it, it, it helps them more because, or I'm sorry, I mean, it helps them. Sorry if I said hurt. It helps them because they, uh, they don't think have it'd be to be worse bad playing Gainesville. I think they have a better home field advantage just knowing they're going to play every year in Jacksonville as opposed to knowing they're going to have to go to Gainesville. I think Gainesville's a very tough place to play uh, as opposed to um, – as opposed to, to Athens, where I, I think that, I mean, Athens is sure it's a great stadium, but I don't think they have as nearly as good a home field advantage as they do in right. Gainesville. So, a uh, follow-up question, does Georgia have a chance? Yeah, they have a chance. I mean, our, I mean, they have a chance because Florida put up 193 yards against South Carolina and won the game because South Carolina handed on the ball four times. Um they didn't do anything in offense. Now, their defense is great, but their Georgia has the ability to score. Um, are they going to score against Florida's offense? But to say, do they have a chance? Yes, I think they have a chance. Do I think that they went off on a bye week and were going to Kentucky with the cocktail party the next week and they went, ah, it's just Kentucky. They basically are, you know, they're walking out dudes from, you know, 17-year-olds, you know. Ah, this would be a piece of cupcake, and they got two 
two quarters into that thing and they were a disaster. Um, so I, I think they're totally, they'll be refocused, but um, Florida's got a tough D, um, but Georgia definitely has a shot. Uh, I think they definitely have a chance at this game. Uh, just just from, I think momentum's a crazy thing. You know, five weeks ago, you know, I mean, yeah, we liked where Florida was, but but it's not like we thought they were the number two team in the country. And, yeah, they've won a few games, and they and they were impressive in that uh, South Carolina game. But I think Blair's right. I think that Georgia's not as bad as we think based off their last game, and Florida's not as good as we think based off their last game. And um, while I'd give the advantage to Florida just based off the history in this in this rivalry, and I think they, they kind of do have Georgia's number, and, uh, it's, and Georgia thinks about it quite a bit, uh, I would say that, this is a, a, a situation where a lot of people are going to underestimate Georgia and they have a good chance for them off upset. Yeah, and I think the other thing you take into consideration is just take a look at South Carolina. Three weeks ago, they're coming off of just an absolute beatdown. I mean, they just laid it on Georgia. I mean, Aaron Murray couldn't throw a forward pass. They go to LSU, struggling that game. LSU's kind of a rebirth, and all of a sudden LSU's got a little bit of momentum. And now South Carolina – you know, has a disaster of a special teams and turnover game. And now everybody's, you know, South Carolina, they're nothing like they were two weeks ago. So it just totally swings weeks to week. It's, it's so much of a different story. I, I'm going to say that, and this is going to be my two cents about everything now. I think that it hurts Georgia. Um, whether it's neutral field or not, uh, if you look at those records, yes, playing in the swamp is a huge disadvantage comparing compared to playing at Jacksonville. But at least playing in Athens, you get a home field advantage every other year. You don't have that now. The cocktail party basically is a home game for Florida as it is because more Florida fans come up there, even though the tickets are 50-50. Uh, more fans from Florida come up there than Georgia anyways. So from a fan perspective, you're going to see, at least in my eyes, it would be they had a better chance having an actual home game between the hedges every other year of, of having a win than, than having to go on the, the neutral field every year. Well, tell me this, because, I mean, Jacksonville, I'm just trying to think of it from a geographic standpoint. I mean, it's not that far. From, I mean, it's a pretty close neutral site for both teams, even though it's in the state of Florida. Um, and – it's just such a traditional thing. I, I don't. I don't think it. Help, I don't think it hurts or helps them. To be honest with you, I think it's just such a unique deal that it's been there. It's kind of the way it is, and it creates its own environment. Um, so much so that they can't actually call it the world's largest cocktail party anymore. So, um, but uh, I, I do think you're right. I mean, if you put it on the campus, um, you know, they both get an advantage of having it at home every other year. Um, but to Drew's point, I think the swamp is way more intimidating place than than Athens. Drew, you want to we'll, we'll switch subjects there. I know that uh, I, I love how that lower third, that orange blends perfectly with your your emblem there. I know. I feel like Google Plus has you know made that especially for UT uh, fans. So, <laughs> what kind of chance does Tennessee have this week? Uh, I, they're winning the game, Shane. So I'd say a really good chance. <laughs> You're going to give South Carolina their third straight loss? <clears throat> Why not? I mean, better to give South Carolina their third straight loss as opposed to Tennessee their, what, fourth straight loss? So, no, I don't know. I mean, I think they have a chance. I think Tennessee is better than uh, – better than, than – I mean, here's the tough thing. Besides that Alabama game, which, I mean, Tennessee was is not in the same league as Alabama, uh, I think they played just as good as Mississippi State. They had good second-half adjustments, and they just didn't close the game out. They they played, they played they played three great quarters against Mississippi State. Yeah, yeah, and in Florida they played three good quarters against Florida and couldn't close the game out. And in Georgia, I mean, they were they were they had the ball with a chance to take the lead late in the game and just couldn't do it. And and now the bottom line is they've lost all four of those games. But I do think that I think Tennessee's everybody goes on the fact that Tennessee has lost eleven of the last twelve uh, eleven of the last twelve home game or SEC games, but eleven. Uh, you know, 10 of those 11 losses are against teams that are in the top 20. Uh, it's tough to play in the SEC. That's all there is to it. And I don't think Tennessee is as bad as their record, and I don't think Tennessee is as bad as all the people saying you should fire Dooley, which I, I'm not going to say that I would be upset if they got somebody else, but uh, I, I am 
of the camp of saying it's very difficult the fact that Tennessee has lost to the number one team in the country, the number two team in the country, a team that was ranked in the top five when they played them, and a 7-0 undefeated team. 27-1 and is the record of teams that Tennessee's played that they've lost to this year. So they're not losing games that they're supposed to win. They're losing all these games that are either toss-ups or they're supposed to lose. So as a Tennessee fan, I'm disappointed about that, but it doesn't make me think that their team's not good. I still think Tennessee has a top 25 team. Now, now Blair was saying – a top 25 team, okay. Uh, <laughs> Blair was saying that if they lose this game, they're gonna, they, there's a good chance that they could just spiral and, and give up and, and the rest of their seasons for not. What, what is your thoughts on that? No, I, I didn't necessarily say that. I said we don't know what's going to happen because we don't know what – but that was, not, that was one of the options that could happen, you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what we just don't know what's going to happen. If they lose to South Carolina, you know, what, what, is, what has happened is, is that in two days it's gone from, hey, here's John Gruden, we're talking about it again, to they've got a Wikipedia page saying he's coming to Tennessee. I mean, in two days it's gotten ramped up to a fever pitch that does a loss to South Carolina, which everybody, to be honest with you, most people assume that's going to happen just because they just think defensively they can't stop anybody. And, uh, and if that happens, then what, what precipitates it? It's like, it's like everyone, every loss is exponentially larger. You know, it's, it's funny. And Drew, you can attest to this. And I missed part of y'all's conversation when I got knocked off there. So I don't know exactly what you covered, but I mean, if you would tell me before the Alabama game, Everybody thought that they were going to lose against Alabama, right? Yeah, but then, when, but then we would lose against Alabama, who's the number one team in the country, who has dominated everybody in college football. It's just like it exponentially got worse, you know, because all of a sudden, you know, you're one in ten, but you knew you're going to be one in eleven. But when you saw the one in eleven, now it's even worse. Than, you know, it's kind of like this this crescendo that's building um, that doesn't really makes sense. I mean, they are losing uh, to the you know four really, really good teams. Well, that's that's um, the hard thing. I, I agree with you, Blair, and that's what I was telling Shane is it's like you're, you know, you've got a kid, you know, I don't know how to give another analogy besides you've got a football team that we really don't know how good they are. And, and Shane laughed when I said top 25. Do I think Tennessee should be ranked in the top 25? No. But is, is there a chance that Tennessee has a team that is the 25th best team in the nation? Yeah, absolutely. It's just very difficult. To, to know when every loss they've had is either against a team that's either in the top ten or has been in the top ten this year. Uh, I don't know where Mississippi State is, but, I mean, they're a 7-0 team. They're 27-1. Yeah. and one. And 11 of their last 12 SEC games they've lost, but 10 of those 11, besides the Kentucky game, have been against teams that are ranked in the top 25. Yeah, so and, I, and I think the thing – I mean, these are good teams they're losing to, so I, and, I don't know how good Tennessee is or how bad they are. And I think I think the thing that we would have said before the season is Derek Dooley, his whole career, his whole if he gets a fourth year, is basically tied to Tyler Bray. It's tied to Tyler Bray, Justin Hunter, and these guys that are going to play in the last two weeks have been the worst games that they've played. Um, and it's been two really good things. But, I mean, Tyler Bray goes under 200 yards the last two games, and, uh, you know, Hunter – you know, you just got to keep feeding him. But, you know, Hunter just has underachieved for what his level of play is um, this year. And, you know, now you've got, you know, Dooley's kind of coming off the Tyler Bray. You know, he can't get loose with the ball. But you basically have called him out publicly and said, you know, you can't you can't keep doing this. When, when I look at Tyler Bray, and you could – I hope I would think you'd say the same thing, Drew, is that – Tyler Bray knows when he goes into the game, he's going to have to score 40 points. And so he's going to have to throw the football. He's going to have to take chances, or they don't have a prayer. So now you're telling a kid that knows he has to actually take the chances. He's got to be a little bit smarter. But now you throw another scenario of, well, I might yank you and put Worley in, and he hasn't reacted fantastic to everything that's happened in his career anyway. I think it's just – there's a lot of stuff going on that uh, I'm anxious to see uh, what happens this week and, and then really what it crescendos to next week because they got four winnable games there. It can be, you know, right there at the end. And, you know, are they going to be a team that says, I'm going to fight for my coach and be prideful and see what I can get done? Well, that's, I, I think know. that's the problem. And you're exactly right. I agree with you 100% on Tyler Bray. 
Uh, and I said this last year. I think Tyler Bray has a ton of talent, but I think his problem, his main problem, is the fact that he, he is a gunslinger. He, um, you know, I, I'm Shane. I know you're going to laugh at this, but I'm not comparing him to Brett Favre. But he has that Brett Favre mentality of if there's a little window there, he's got the arm strength to fit it through there. So he's going to try. And the problem with that is Brett Favre leads the has the all-time record for most touchdowns in the NFL. But if I'm not mistaken, I think he has the all-time record for most interceptions as well yeah. too. So you have a quarterback like that. They're going to make big plays, and they're going to have big numbers, which Bray does have good numbers right now, but they're going to have a lot of interceptions as well. And you're right. They have to make plays because their defense is not keeping them in it at all. So there's never going to be a game where Tyler Bray knows, hey, if I just don't make mistakes and our running game can pick up some chunks of yard, we'll win the game. They've, they've, their running game has been good enough to do that. Right. The problem is they don't have the kind of team – Tennessee has to score on almost every possession, and and that's that's the tough thing. And and you take about two or three plays away from uh, uh from that uh, Mississippi State game, and Tennessee could have won that game. But I mean, you turn two or three what could have been positive plays and turn them into negative plays, you lose games. The problem once again with Tennessee is this is I think twelve straight games where they went in. You know, hey, we got a chance to win. This would be a big win, and they they're zero for twelve on them. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what's bad is Tennessee and everybody laughs, especially Shane, who's a big Kentucky fan, and, and, and he hasn't followed Tennessee football for 40 years. I mean, he knows who they are, but Tennessee fans, we still think we're a top five program. I mean, that's just all there is to it. I mean, Tennessee was a top ten program in the 90s, and now there really are. I mean, I'd say they're the seventh or eighth best program. I'm not talking about best team. I'm talking about program in the SEC. Drew, that's how we were the Billy Gillespie years. Yeah, exactly. And that's how Alabama was. <laughs> it's it's the whole thing. This the I mean, Shula years. This could be the Shula years. It really could. Now, I mean, Tennessee was every bit as good as Alabama in the 90s. Alabama won a national championship in the 90s. Tennessee won a national championship in the 90s. Tennessee finished in the top 10, you know, almost every year for a long stretch there. Um, and now they've had about seven or eight years where they've been bad. And that's the whole thing is Tennessee fires a Philip Fulmer, which I don't know if it's a great idea or not, because – they hadn't been good for three or four years. They didn't make a bowl game. I mean, oh, my God, since he didn't make a bowl game, we got to fire Fulmer. Uh, but now they're in a situation where they've had about five years in a row where they haven't been relevant. And, uh, well, the other thing, Drew, is, I mean, you take you as at your age, all you've known is the 90s in the first part of 2000s in Tennessee football, which you grew up in. I mean, you guys had, you know, the four-year record of what, what you win, 40 out of 45 games. I mean, it was Alabama-esque. Um, you know, during that 97 to 2000, whatever that stretch there where you win the national championship. And Manny send, Martin years? Yeah, but you send, yeah, and you send 48 players off of a squad of 85 scholarships to the freaking NFL. I mean, it was a very, very good decade where you had that four year window where you got the recruits, you recruited nationally, they all hit. There was no attrition. They were super talented, and you made a run. And you would have think, okay, five years ago when you're with Mike Shula, does Alabama? Do you sit there and go, well, Alabama's gonna, you know, be, you know, favored in 35 straight football games in three years? Yeah, you would have never thought that. No, I mean, Tennessee <clears> had I mean, a stretch of about seven years in a row or eight years in a row where they beat Alabama every year. Yeah. So I mean, it's just ebbs and flows, and and that's the thing about. I'm telling you, that's the exact thing that the reason Tennessee fans get so excited and say, "Let's get John Gruden," because look what Alabama did. Alabama, right. you know, they had they they went through what three or four coaches with uh, Shula and Price and Francione, where they really couldn't get you know. Uh, a, a guy that that was really leading them, and yeah. then you know, after they a debacle of Debose, yeah, yeah, and then Debose as well, yeah. and then out of the blue they get you know Nick Saban, who's a proven coach, and anybody you know, I think most of us will agree that Gruden probably would do a good job in the NFL. He's yeah, he's he's a young, energetic, or in the in college football, he's young and energetic. Yeah, and, I was gonna say he did real well in the NFL, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did. He did good. He had a Super Bowl championship, and, you know. <laughs> Had like sixty games in a row, where, or sixty. Got right, traded. You know, many, yeah, he got traded. He got yeah. traded for draft picks as a coach. But yeah. so I mean, yeah, Tennessee fans get excited about it, and it's just one of those things where. I, well, I, I mean, know. when you take a look at it, Drew, I mean, just from a guy looking out of it that has no dog in the hunt, and honestly, love the fact when Tennessee struggles. To be honest with you, just because I live here. Um, but the the funny thing is, is that when you look at Fulmer, and I mean, you hire Lane Kiffin at the time. You don't really know what to make of it, but he came in and he created this little vibrant deal. Now, if he stays, are you on NCAA 
violations. You don't know that, but who did who did Tennessee know that USC, the only job that the dude would have taken outside of Tennessee, was going to come open? And then all of a sudden, a year later, you're sitting there with your hands. You know, you don't you make the move against Fulmer, and then you have the totally unexpected thing happen a year later that leaves you at the altar, so to speak. And you've got to go out and find a coach when you're really not prepared to. You're late to the ball game, and uh, you know you've got you know 31 secondary violations or whatever it was that stupid things he did and the way they left. So well, I think that's um, what's tough. I think you're right. I mean, Tennessee goes and hires a coach in Lane Kiffin. That's a little unproven. You take a big risk on getting a guy that could really boom. And he and he, he looked like he was going to do that. I mean, look at his first year. He beat South Carolina when he wasn't supposed to beat South Carolina. Should have beat Alabama the year they won the national yeah. championship. I mean, they were a missed field goal by the fact that Daniel Lincoln can't kick a field goal, you know, more than three feet off the ground from winning that game. Um, hitting, what's his name? Mouth Cody. <laughs> left breast. Uh, I mean, that's just, that's just, I mean, that's a tough way to lose a game. And then he leaves, you're exactly right. And now, not only do you have to replace, you know, a coaching legend in Fulmer, you have to go through a, a school that's going to have – you'll be the third coach in, in like, two years. Yeah. And also the fact that they've got all this NCAA sanctions hanging over their head. So, yeah, Derek Dooley's probably the best Tennessee could have gotten. And that's that's kind of sad because he was a under-500 coach at Louisiana Tech. In retrospect, let me ask you this, and, and I, I'm not trying to, to, to get on the beat down of Tennessee, but th- this is a serious question. Do you think Tennessee would have been better off to pull an Arkansas and just bring in somebody for a one-year fix than try to bring in uh, Dooley to give him a long-term, somewhat long-term contract uh, and, and try to piece something together that way or just write that year off and then try to rebuild and get that, that coach of the future that could be um, Tennessee into the to, – to, to bring Tennessee back to where Fulmer had him in the 90s? Uh, I think that Tennessee – I think Derek Dooley was probably Tennessee's sixth or seventh choice. I, I would imagine that Tennessee went hard after a, uh, a John Gruden, but Gruden said you're going to have to pay me 5 or $6 million to come do it, and Tennessee wasn't going to pay in that range. Um, I, you know, I mean, they, they almost hired David Cutcliffe. Cutcliffe was yeah. going to come to Tennessee, but he didn't want to uh, – he wanted to take his whole staff with him. And they were like, no, we want you to keep these, these coaches – you know, because we've got the recruits and whatnot, and, and we're trying to do this. And I think that Derek Dooley was was a, a low on the totem pole chance, and the fact that if they had just gotten a John L. Smith type one year replacement, no, I don't think they'd have been any better the next year. Yeah, I think see is a better situation now if they went to hire a coach than they, oh, yeah. than they were because they they have they do have great facilities and they do have a better it's a much better roster than it was. Yes, today. and the other thing that you had is that Derek Dooley not only did the, the problem that Tennessee ran into Shane was number one, they needed to keep some assistance. So they had to find somebody that would be willing to do that. But in return, what happened is, is it allowed Dooley came because it was his shot. Um, but the other thing was, is it gave him leverage to be able to manage the buyout system on the back end. Well, you're going to make me take these assistants. I'm going to need this. I'm going to have, have attrition. I'm going to have this. So he was able to hold Hamilton and all of them at that time uh, to these ridiculous buyouts where three years later you got $5 million still on the table. Um, so it, it was a good job by him, obviously being a smart guy, an attorney and a lawyer. You know, Not quite Chiswick-like yeah. numbers, but they're, they're up there. Yeah, but he didn't win national championships. So Chiswick, you know, it wasn't – Chiswick didn't roll into Auburn going, hey, I need a big buyout. He went and, you know, bought the best player in the last 50 years, got a national championship, and then said, hey, pay me. You know, so a little bit different scenario, but, you know, that's the way it is. I mean, it's kind of hard. To, uh, Cam's having some good times on those press conferences, isn't he? Yeah, he's not handling it too well. And, and, and what, what, he's having a he's having a hard time uh, getting paid every week. He's just he's just those lump lump sums. Well, did you see Warren Moon? At, oh, I don't go too far off this this rat hole down the NFL. But did you see where Warren Moon came to his defense? Um, so about, it was racial. Yes. Yeah. And and yeah. really, I mean, look at his yeah, numbers this year, idiot, man. Yeah. He just needs to go play in the CFL. Yeah. I, I like or, or beat his wife. Cause, cause, <laughs> cause, 
you know, one of those two things. One of those two things. Yeah. I don't know. I just but it's a it's a ridiculous statement because I think you can actually take a look in the NFL. This is totally off topic, but you pick any, you know, uh, I mean, what did people, you know, Michael Vick's been in the league for three years. They get on him because he's a turnover machine. Well, what do they get on uh, Tony Romo for? He's a turnover machine. He gets killed just like Michael Vick gets killed. You know, uh, you know, they get on Jamarcus Russell because he's a big bust. Well, Ryan Leaf got destroyed because he was even a bigger bust. I mean, for every every scenario that you got, I think it's I think it's a, I think there's I don't think in the NFL there's any type of it's a such a production prove it league that it doesn't matter if you're white, black, or Asian, they're going to just wear you out if you don't produce. Yeah, I think that I really think that's the issue. It is it's production. It has nothing to do with the color of his skin. Yeah. And then if you and then if you are told that, hey, you're a little bit immature, we think this guy's immature, and then two years later he's immature, then it goes to, well, that makes it a lot of big you know, when you've been warned about something, um, that's just the way it is. And then you can't call anybody, you know I mean the call a woman reporter sweetheart, I mean he deserves to get blasted. Who who who's surprised about what he's done? I mean, look at his track record. Last year yeah. was the anomaly. Yeah. Last year was the anomaly where this kid, had, you know, was great, did everything right, yeah. answered the questions all right. I mean, this is the same guy that got kicked out of Florida for stealing laptops and 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 almost got kicked out of what Ben Community College yeah. or whatever that is for cheating on tests. So, well, guess what happens? Took two hundred fifty thousand dollars to play in a season of college football. So, right, and what happens, guys, is that uh, you know in the NFL, every coach looks at every play. So they basically went back on a team that was six and ten, and basically broke down every play from Cam Newton and put together a Cam Newton package. And guess what? Yeah, it's just the way it is. Yeah, I mean. It's the same old sewing, man. Everybody else gets paid there, too. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to give him too much airtime there, but I thought that was just kind of ridiculous. I mean, to me, there's too many black quarterbacks that have proven themselves in the NFL to, to say that this is racial, that people are getting on Cam Newton. Yeah. It's it's the simple fact that he's been ineffective. I yeah. mean, it, he had great numbers last year, but the team stunk. So, yeah. you know, What's the difference? They, they still are the same team. They, they've lost a lot of games. They don't deserve half the, the, the sports talk that they're getting right now because they're not a good team. So, yeah. anyways, let's get back to the SEC and, and folks that don't get $200,000 to play football. I hear you. Uh, well, the other games that are out there that we haven't discussed, really, do they, do they deserve a lot of attention? I don't think they do. I mean, we got – Who's Mississippi? Ole Miss has who do they have? Drew or Blair? Quick. Oh man, if you wouldn't ask. Arkansas, me. that's it. Yeah, they're playing at Arkansas, Little Rock. That's a loss. Arkansas's got some motivation, man. So you think Arkansas starting to turn things around? I think so. I think it's a tough place to play. Um, Ole Miss had a week off though, but uh, I think Arkansas's getting a little bit of confidence back they settled in on Dennis Johnson we're running the ball and uh, Tyler Tyler Wilson's come back and they've settled down a little bit on defense it looks like so it's what Kentucky's um, good for giving other teams confidence yeah I mean just the way it rolls Drew you got any thoughts on that game uh just uh, that's a non-watch for me <laughs> I, don't, I mean I don't know what to tell you uh no. there's two teams that that are great I don't know much about it I kind of agree I think Arkansas is better than their record and better than what people think and Ole Miss, uh, I think they're a little outmanned in this game. We have to also remember that Arkansas was rated in the, ranked in the top ten at some point this year, so I would still say that they're the better team. And then the next game that we haven't touched on is Texas A&M at Auburn. Oh, wow. I think Texas A&M is a good team. Uh, yeah. I think they have a good program and a good team, uh, and I think that they're better than Auburn. Auburn is – God, I, I just couldn't believe – I mean, Vandy tried to give that game away too. Uh, against Auburn this last week. I didn't think Vandy played great, especially at the end there, and Auburn's just not wasn't good enough to take advantage of it, and I think Texas A&M's too good. Yeah, they're, the, Auburn's a disaster. I think t- you know, Texas A&M doesn't play well on the road. I mean, they've proved that, um, but I don't, I don't think that, um, you know, you, you go to Ole Miss, Ole Miss can put some points on the board, so you're playing against a tough offense. You know, Louisiana Tech, you go to that Shreveport game, and, you know, you get up 27, and you – 
start coming back, Louisiana Tech, and put some points on the board. Auburn can't put any points on the board. They're in a disaster mode. And I think Texas A&M needs – I think they've gotten popped in the mouth by LSU in the Florida game at home, and they're getting a little bit of that, hey, we got two losses now, and I, we need to kind of go out and show ourselves. And I think this one's going to be a freaking 35-point blowout. And then the last game, and it doesn't. I mean, there's no, there's no even line on this. It's Vanderbilt. Uh, Thirty-five, uh, man. And really? That's what that's what I heard earlier this week. Yeah, that's yeah, a it's a it's a big line. Uh, it's not on our pick'em that we do. It's still off the board. It, there's no line listed on it. Sorry. It's a disaster. They. Uh, that's a Vandy win. Yeah. So. Yeah, I agree. Other than that, um, you know, it's that time of the podcast where we are, are open for the open mic, and Blair will let you start, then head to Drew, and then I'll close things out. Oh, man, I'm, a, I'm just excited about uh, Saturday night as a state fan being 7-0 and and going into Tuscaloosa. I mean, it's we said we could possibly do it, and they've done everything they were supposed to do. So um, I'll be uh, sitting on the couch with uh, – with the old M State jersey, uh, not jersey, but T-shirt on with my Red Hook IPAs, ready to watch it and see if we can't pull something out. So will you ring the cowbell at your house? No. Okay. Hi, Dad. That's, that's safe for the game only. Don't want to wake the, don't wanna going, wake the yeah, boy. I'm going, uh, I'm going the next week, so got to get, gotta get the arm rested for the following week. And that's A&M, is it not? That's right, man. Drew? Uh, Anything there? First of all, let me ask this. I, I was wondering, I'm looking at a strength of schedule ranking right now. How in the hell can Tennessee not have the number one strength of schedule ranking? They, they're rated number 25. They've played yeah. four teams in the top 11. I don't care who else you play. When you play four teams in the top 11, you should have a top one strength of schedule rating. But that's ridiculous. Um, who's up to who's Give me some teams that surprised you on that list. Well, Kansas. I mean, Kansas is number one. They're all in the Big 12. I mean, I think the Big 12, the SEC should have the top, uh, what, 14 strength of schedule because the SEC is so much better than every other conference. Um, you've got, like, Kansas and Iowa State and Baylor, Texas, West Virginia. So the top five are all Big 12 schools. Then you have Notre Dame, and then you have two more Big 12 schools. So a bit of a little bias that way. Here's a good stat. The top – 15, all of them are either from the SEC or Big 12. Um, which except goes to show for Notre Dame. You, except for Notre Dame, which goes to show you that those two teams are the power conferences. And uh, anyway, sorry, I just I had to get on that. Well, quick. if you just look at the rankings right now, I mean, that's the both of those teams dominate the top 20. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that's easy to say that those would be that way. I'm surprised there's not more SEC teams in the top ten. Well, to be honest with you guys, I mean, I think part of the reason some of them aren't in there is because of the – Haven't the played SEC, each other? Yeah, the SEC West hasn't played each other yet. I mean, the, the top four in the SEC West are about – they're in the midst of starting their little round-robin deal. You know, Alabama, that's what we talked about earlier in the podcast. You know, Mississippi but, State, you think Tennessee and Auburn are going to be better and – but yeah, that won't yeah. that won't affect their strength of schedule because it it they haven't played them yet. There's, but all those teams should be ranked. If anything, that should help them because they would be ranked higher because they don't have losses yet. Yeah, I don't know. It just uh, I it, it's it makes me question all these computer rankings and, and the fact that you're using all this stuff to determine the you know the the national champion in the playoffs because these computers don't know what the hell they're talking about. So. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, anybody that says, you know, anybody right now that – I hate to say this, but anybody that's ranking Kansas State above those SEC teams, I mean, that just doesn't make any sense to me. I've watched Kansas State play the last two years. I don't know what – don't ask me why I have, but I've watched a ton of their games, and, and I think I like them, and I think Colin Klein's a good quarterback, but they're not – I mean, I just can't see how you, you rank them ahead of Florida right now. Look at the past six years of college football. The SEC should get the benefit of the doubt. And I think they finally are to a degree, but – Everybody still wants that team. I mean, they everybody wants to see it be somebody besides the Alabama Florida National Championship or oh, yeah. two SEC teams. They want Oregon to be good, and they want Kansas State to keep winning. Yeah, the, what everybody else wants outside the SEC is for teams to be undefeated so that there's no way there's going to be a 1-2 SEC finish. And we talked about some scenarios where it could be possible. 
um, that the SEC still could have a one-two uh, finish, and that, that they're not likely, but there's still some scenarios out there. I think that that could cause the SEC to, to go one-two in the BCS. I think the big thing is if LSU can beat. Uh, you might have already talked about this, but if LSU can beat Alabama, then I think that's huge because while we'll the same scenario as last year, if LSU beats Alabama, LSU would go to the SEC championship game. Alabama would be sitting there with one loss, and they'd go and probably play the winner of that SEC championship game. We, that's the that's that's the, the scenario we, where the SEC would have two teams again. We didn't even bring up that one. I was saying Florida loses to Florida State and beats Alabama. Yeah, it could be. I'd still I would I just I would hesitate to think that a team would lose their conference championship game and get back in. I know it happened with Nebraska a few years ago in the Rose Bowl uh, in 2001, I think, but. I just think that's going to be very difficult to, to lose your the last game you played and then play the national championship. And it, it happened as well in 96 with Florida against Florida State. Well, I, think, for the national championship. I think the other thing is is that if you got it, – it's just all kinds of scenarios, but they don't want that to happen, so the human poles are going to try to create it and make it as difficult as possible. But it doesn't matter because Mississippi State is going to be LSU in two weeks anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Is that is that after they beat Alabama next week? Is that how confident you are? No, I mean my whole time I had, I we, I don't know. We don't have a prayer against Alabama or LSU. <laughs> if, I, if I can take a win against Texas A&M, Arkansas, and Ole Miss, I'll take ten and two for the first time ever in regular season and just call it a day. Who's Mississippi? What are their wins this year, Blair? What do you mean the what all seven? Wins? Yeah, who do they beat? Jackson State, Auburn. Um, at Troy, South Alabama, Kentucky, Tennessee, Middle Tennessee. So that that is that's. I mean, you'll take seven and zero all day, but we really don't have any clue what kind of team they have. Right. You know. I mean, and and you, I think you would agree. I watched that. You know, I didn't get to talk to you about that Tennessee Mississippi, Mississippi State game, but uh, I mean, Tennessee could have won that game. I mean, that you know, it was. I don't think that Tennessee necessarily played bad and Mississippi State played good. I think if they played ten times, I think it would. I don't think anybody would win more than six of them. You know, right? So well, I, I think the thing that you, the thing that if you watch in Mississippi State and you do it too, like I mean, you, you watch Tennessee and so you know a lot more about it than I would actually know. But the thing about Mississippi State is Mississippi State is gone from getting in those games and that Tennessee game. Mississippi State loses that game if it's last year, last three, in the last three years. They lose that game, but you have a guy like a Jonathan Banks that basically strips a running back coming out and makes one of the – I mean, which I think is the play of the game, where a guy just strips him and makes – I mean, he just makes a play that nobody else just makes on the field. And all of a sudden you go from driving down and up three points to bam, let's pop it in and stretch it back out to ten points again. Um Stay, every time they've needed to make a play, they've made it. And, um, you know, everybody's kind of gotten on to them about the non-conference schedule, and that's the way it's been. The last five years, it's always been Auburn, LSU, or, or Georgia, or whoever the East team is that you play in the first four weeks. And they've always they've always started out one and two, one and three, or two and two at the best. And so whenever they realigned the, the SEC schedule, it forced us to actually get a new non-conference game and had to give up one. And so we ended up kind of late in the ball game, and so you don't really have a very competitive non-conference schedule. But that was the whole point at the beginning of the year. Everybody knew that Mississippi State had a chance to be 7-0 and or 6-1 and at the worst if they really depending on that Tennessee game. And uh, they've done everything they're supposed to do. So now is the test that we all knew was coming, which is Alabama, Texas A&M, LSU, Arkansas, Ole Miss. That's a pretty. Yeah. That's a pretty. Stuff. Got, I mean, the next three weeks. The meet, the meet yeah. right now, and that's what's funny. I was I was sitting there looking, and I, if you recall, you know that when Texas A&M and Missouri came into the SEC, you know all the schools had to drop one of their. Uh, East or West games, depending, you know, they had to drop one of their cross conference games so they could pick up the other, you know, East yeah. game or whatever. So Tennessee added Missouri and they dropped Arkansas. And I remember thinking, all right, if you're going to have to drop either Arkansas or Mississippi State, I'd much rather drop Arkansas. Shoot, thank yeah. goodness Tennessee got a break there. But damned if, you know, 
Yeah. Mississippi State's better than Arkansas. I don't care what you say. They're a better football team than Arkansas is playing this year. So it, it's worked out. You know, once again, congratulations, Tennessee. You got you drew the short stick and everything goes wrong for you. Right. I mean, it's just like next year. They come out in 2013, and we're, we're not going to do a return trip to you guys. We're actually going to South Carolina. Well, crap, yeah, South Carolina is going to be pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I mean, so it's it's one of those deals. It's just kind of the way it works out. But this year was a little bit funky because – We've never had the ability to gain, you know, the one thing I liked about Dan Mullen, the one thing I've always said is that he gets better as the year goes on. Um, but the problem was is that you could never, you're always trying to catch up and get to that bowl eligibility. And, you know, we're going to find out in the next three weeks. We may be in three weeks looking at it and going, y'all are South Carolina and you lost two and on the verge of possibly losing a third one and completely out of the talk for anything. You know, because, I mean, South Carolina's basically turned to let's beat Tennessee and beat Clemson and go to a bowl game. It's totally turned. Yeah. You know, they're out of it. All right. I am going to use my uh, open <laughs> mic to throw it back to you guys one last time. Uh, and I think you alluded to it before we actually got on on air, Blair, and that's the uh, John Calipari ESPN thing. Have either of you guys been able to catch any of that yet? And if so, what are your thoughts? I have I've watched a little bit of it. I've probably watched um, of probably two episodes, sixty minutes. I've probably watched fifteen or twenty minutes. Um, first of all, I think it's ridiculous that that he actually has an all access show because I think it's re- just so unfair. That it's not even funny. But that's just another topic for another day. But um, Kyle Perry, man, for as much as you want to just hate the dude. He is such a good coach, it's not even funny. The way he communicates with those kids, um, and if and Shane, when you get a chance and you watch, um, there's a spot, I think, in the second version of it where they're fixing to start, I guess, practice or whatever. So they got – and he basically put on the chalkboard. He's like, these next five days are the most critical five days. We're going to know in five days really where this foundation of this team's going to be. And that might be, I'm fine with it, and we're going to move from there. Or it might be, we need another week to find out what the foundation of this team is, right? And uh, and it was interesting how he communicated. You're going to see that I'm not going to get on to you first because you don't know anything. I won't get on to you if I if I don't teach you something or I haven't taught you something. But whenever you decide not to do something once you've learned it. That's when the other guy comes out. And so it was really interesting how he communicated it from uh, and set expectations and did those types of things. It, um, he, I could see how he can go into a living room and tell a guy that, hey, you can come to Kentucky, but you got to understand that every time you step on the floor, it's going to be the other team's best shot you're getting. And if you don't want to play that day, it ain't going to happen. So it was pretty interesting. I hate him, but... It's pretty cool. <laughs> Drew, did you catch any of it? Uh, no, I haven't watched it. It's not fair that Kentucky gets to have a recruiting show that goes yes. on ESPN and every other team doesn't. Ridiculous. I but love it. Why does it matter? I mean, Cal Perry, if, if every year that Kentucky doesn't win a national championship uh, is just just an indictment, uh, they should win every year because they get to pick whatever five, six players they want every year. Um, and if you can't win by loading the loading your team, then then it's a joke anyway. So, I mean, look at what they're doing this year in recruiting. I mean, they really do. They get to pick. You get to pick anybody you want. It's like the like the little league coach that stacks the team. He goes to the draft and he's like, "Yeah, I need uh, this kid and this kid because I I carry them. I, they ride in my truck and they live close to me." I mean, he's just getting whatever players he wants. And and you know, if you can't win with those guys, then then that the shame on you. We win with those guys. Yeah, he won once. He, you know, he's lost about three years, and he's won one. And we'll see what happens this year. And I mean, he'll win next year. I mean, look what he's got coming in next year. Well, see, the thing, the thing, and, the thing about it is, you know, they've put what fifteen players in three years in the pros, six, four, and five. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the kicker. Now at Kentucky, he won the national championship, but that was a special team last year. That was a special group of guys. Um, you know, the thing that Cal Perry has now is he's got a track track record of the last six years of 
putting people in the league, and that's his most important thing. That's what he wants yes. to have happen. And he said it, and he had not apologized for it, and Kentucky fans get mad about it because, you know, the six draftees are the most, you know, the greatest day in Kentucky basketball because all they care about is championships. Um, he's satisfied them now, but it's going to be interesting to see because that's hard to rekindle every year um, like he's doing it. And we, we, say that, we said that last year, um, but you're going to have more – DeMarco Cousin, John Walls that get put out in the Elite Eight, then you have the other guys that take Big it all to the championship. And, and Davis, those kind I, of think, I think um, I think I don't think you have every year you have a yeah, like a Gilchrist that's gonna take the fourth most shots and you know, the number one draft pick's gonna take the fifth most shots. Um, they just don't come along with those guys. So what you have that's different with the Kentucky program today versus the past championship teams and past Kentucky programs to me is the and you, you alluded to it, 15 players in three years. Kentucky has always had a few players going into the NBA, but not this mass amount of players that are going into the NBA, especially talking about underclassmen going to the, to the, uh, to the NBA. So what you're now proving is that this can work. So you're right, it is becoming the pick of the litter kind of program could because it's like, all right, if you come play for Kentucky, you're going to be able to have the opportunity to go to the, uh, to the NBA. I've, I've showed this time and time and time again. We're, our goal is to win championships, and I've proven that we can do that. So if you can buy in to the way I want to coach you and the system the way I need it to happen, these things can occur. Uh, it, it opens the door to a Kentucky program that we've not seen in the past. So that's that's my that's what I'm so excited about is that yeah the the other thing that you got to take into consideration Shane is that you guys spent three hundred thirty thousand dollars on March Madness which is more than your football recruiting budget so that's just ridiculous. Well, if you and, and it's simple economics. If if we had a football program that made us half as much money as our basketball program, I mean, if you look at the and I don't have it and I don't know I wouldn't have time to research it at this point, but if you look at the the top 20 programs in the United States in revenue, Kentucky is in that in that list, and I think they're in the top 10. And it's because of their basketball program, not because of their football program. The football program does make money, but when you compare it to the Texas A&Ms and the, even the UT, USC's, they're, they're predominantly bringing in all their revenue from the football side of things. Kentucky is able to stay in that conversation as some of the most lucrative money-making programs uh, in, in sports because of their basketball. When football can do that, you're going to be able to have an argument with, with them spending that kind of money. But otherwise, it's, it's what's needed to stay competitive on that global, global market in collegiate, fo co collegiate sports. So, I, think it, I think it's ridiculous. Just jealous. Yeah, if you don't, well, if you don't want to play eighteen freshmen and be good at football, then just be that way. That's just it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Anything else before we wrap this yeah. thing up? Find me on Twitter at P Shane Bailey. Drew. Uh, you can find me at Drew Young Twenty. Um, I had a great time in Vegas. I came back alive. Came back with a little bit of money. Um, surprise, surprise! My sports betting was probably the best thing that I did. I lost in the other things I played, but uh, it was a good time and and uh, glad to be back on the roundtable, even if it was for a short time. This this podcast. Oh, we're glad to have you here, Blair. Anything? Yeah, yeah at Blair Smiley. Don't look for any tweets, but uh, I do have a uh, a, a good eat um, location. If you ever go to Chattanooga. Um, Go eat breakfast at uh, Aretha Frankenstein's. Um, huh. One of the better places I've ever eaten. It sits about nine people, and it's an old house on the north side of the river. Um, and I have never in my life gotten two pancakes and not finished them. And I did that. So they uh fantastic place, but pretty cool. So on my list as we go to... That way, Aretha Frankenstein's definitely. Aretha, Aretha Frankenstein's, it's unbelievable. And with Aretha, and, they, and then they actually have, uh, and also if you're going there and you're not driving anywhere, you're going to be able to kind of hang out all day, uh, get one of their uh, uh, 
brew mimosas, which is basically a pear cider beer with apple with uh, orange juice. It's fantastic. Just to say. All right, and with Aretha, we're going to call this podcast done. <laughs>